welcome back to the Flow and Flourish podcast. I am your host, the Capacity Coach, Nicole Roan, and I am so glad that you are here today, tuning in, checking out what's going on on the podcast. This month is going to be full of so much information, and because there are so many different awarenesses happening, I'm kind of doing a combo on quite a few of them. So we're going to be talking mostly about finances, but how it impacts the other areas of our lives. So before I go further, let me just say, if you have not listened to the first couple of episodes and you are new here, welcome to the safe space where we talk openly and honestly about how our ability to flow effortlessly between our personal and our professional lives can be impacted by what's going on in our hearts what's going on in our heads, what's going on with our health, all of these different things. So make sure you check out those first couple of episodes that give you the foundation of what this whole podcast is built on, because it's really going to help you get the most out of this podcast. I know that most of the listeners here are busy, high-performing women who are the ones in all of their friends and family circles, so I know you don't have time to waste. So make sure that you go ahead and check out those first couple of episodes. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe because you're going to want to stay. It's all kind of goodies that are being dropped on this podcast. So again, welcome. And I appreciate you tuning in. Now, as for today, I am talking to the Rhonda Williams. She is an amazing financial coach who you are really going to want to connect with after this episode. Before I read her bio, let me just go ahead and let you know that this episode is being brought to you by the Capacity Calculator. Yes, the Capacity Calculator is a tool that was created to really help you get a better idea of what exactly is on your plate. Because as you are managing your household, managing your business, managing being the boss at work, You're also trying to manage your personal life. And sometimes we can take on much more than we really have the capacity to deal with. So go to my website, NicoleRone.com, check out the capacity calculator and take your free assessment today. And once you're done with that assessment, I want you to book your free 15 minute discovery call so that we can talk a little bit about those results and see how I can help you to really increase your own capacity for sustainable success. All right, let me go ahead and formally introduce my girl, Rhonda. Rhonda J. Williams is the Limitless Possibility Coach. As a financial educator, executive coach, and transformational speaker, she has educated, coached, and trained thousands, y'all, thousands of clients to transform their money and their lives. Her work has been featured in Upscale Magazine, and she has shared her talents with the Walmart Foundation, and the Steve Harvey Act Like a Success Institute. Rhonda is literally on a mission to help you build a bridge over the roadblocks that keep you stuck and create keys to limitless possibilities in your money and throughout your life. Welcome, Miss Rhonda, to the Flow and Flourish podcast. Rhonda, welcome to the Flow and Flourish podcast. How are you? I am doing well. Excited to be here with you. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. You know, we love to talk. (laughs) Oh, yes. We could talk all day long. Before we jump in, I just want to let everybody know how we met. I've had a handful of our wonderful P2P sisters on the podcast. And so I'm honored to have you in the space to talk about stress and finances, because (laughs) this month is Stress Awareness Month. And it kicks off financial literacy and, you know, hearing your story on other podcasts, talking with you personally, I just am really excited to jump in and, and figure out how we can provide some value to the folks that are listening. But I think it's important to kind of start with how you ended up in the space that you're in now. So I always say, you know, by resume, I'm a financial educator, um, executive coach and transformational speaker. I've worked with thousands of clients. My work has been in Upscale Magazine. I've been a 
assistant instructor on the Steve Harvey Act Like a Success Institute. So lots of kudos, things and things and things. So you out here in these money streets, huh? Yes. But, you know, the story so did not begin there. And, you know, there's two really, really pivotal moments on my journey that kind of brought me to where I am today. One is me. I was actually on a government job, got bored, and I got interested in real estate. I really discovered my passion to educate people. Decided to go full time about a year and a half before the market crashed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. (laughs) And so moment number one, I find myself in the bankruptcy attorney's office crying in front of the bankruptcy attorney. And I'm wondering, how did I get here? Because I'm a check boxer. I'm the good girl. I do it right. I stay in the line. I color in the lines, all these things. How did I do this? You know, how did I screw this up this bad, right? And I moved that crying to the car <laughs> after that appointment. So from <laughs> the like office that. to the car. Okay. I'm done. So I went to the car and still pondering and wondering and beating myself up. And one thing in that moment was clear. If I wasn't clear on anything else, I didn't know how I was going to get back up from this. I was clear that, you know, I look back on that decision to leave. I had been on that government job for 15 years. Didn't make sense, right? You get on a good government job, you stay. And so I look back at, did I make a mistake? Did I go too soon? You know, did I get ahead of myself? Did I, did I, did I? And one thing was clear. I wanted to create impact. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have freedom of creativity, right, with what I do. And I I wanted to be able to free to move about myself. And I wasn't getting that where I was, right? And so even though I look back on that decision because of what was happening to me, I was clear that what I wanted in my inner man, that that wasn't going away. Bankruptcy, foreclosure, all the financial yuckies. (laughs) (laughs) And so you know, it was up to me, you know, of course I stayed in that place for a little while. And then it was like, okay, ho ho, what's up? (laughs) What you going to do? (laughs) You know, here forever. Yes. Stay here forever. And so as I began to come back to myself more, I just started to reinvent myself. You know, I actually became a better financial person because I went through all the stuff and the things myself, right? Bankruptcy, foreclosure, me not scared. What you got? When I teach and I train, people come up to me and say, your story is great, but you don't know my story. And I'm like, girl, come on. I've been checked off off twice for all the financial mishaps. Like, and she not scared. Okay. She not scared. (laughs) And so it puts me in a better position to be able to relate to people, been there, done it. And I know how to build from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So that moment really shaped me you know, just to do what I do and really be able to connect with people to be able to translate financial things in a very layman's term, really connect with people and be entertaining, right? And then the second moment, as I began to rebuild myself and reinvent myself, as I moved forward, I came to a point where I wasn't sure if I really believed that I could pull it off, right? Mm. And so I left that moment you know, going after certifications and making sure I was the consummate professional and I could do all the things. And I found myself in another certification course and it was, we were going through things that keep people blocked, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them was self-efficacy. And I had to Google the word. (laughs) I felt like I knew what it meant, but I wasn't completely sure. I did too, after I heard you say it, I'm (laughs) like, that sounds fancy. (laughs) Yes, right. And so it turns out it is the belief in your own capability, right, to be able to pull something off. And in that moment, I had to just stop and think, did I actually believe anymore? I had come a mighty long ways. Okay, look at your neighbor and say a mighty long ways. Mighty long ways. Invested a lot of time, a lot of money. And I had to ask myself, did I actually believe at that point? And it turns out I didn't. I somewhere had slipped. And that was a lot for me because all the things I had done as far as I had come to think that I got this far and didn't believe was life changing. It stabbed me in the gut. 
Mm-hmm. And they were way down the road in the class I was in. They was four PowerPoint screens down the road. And I was just stuck there. But what it did for me is, so it totally shaped. So that first one, really getting clear, shapes the work I do. And the second pivotal point is really understanding that there are roadblocks in life. And we can go after the status quo, the things that the people say we should do, go after education, go after certification, you know, make sure our website is good, our fonts are perfect, our branding (laughs) and our marketing is social media is on it. But if we haven't navigated ourselves, right, you know, you talk about stress and finances, it's us, you know, personal finance is 80% behavior. That would be me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And 20% information. That's the stuff you can Google, right? And so everything I do now takes into account the person, right? Their experience, their exposure, their past around money, around relationships, around all these things and helping them build more of a customized approach to help them move forward based on who they are, right? Again, we can find all the stuff on Google, but we need to know which piece to take, which piece can we take where we are right now, right? How do we get out over ourselves when we run out of gas, <laughs> whatever. But mm-hmm. Yeah, but those two pivotal moments really have shaped everything I do And those two things make me now the limitless possibility coach. Yes. And I love that it's limitless, right? Because oftentimes, you know, as women and just general as people, we have these limits that we place on ourselves Mm -hmm. and it stops us from going where God has called us to go, from Mm -hmm. doing the things that we were, you know, created to do. So I love that what you're doing is limitless, no ceilings, not even a glass one to shatter, just no limits whatsoever. And you said a couple of things as you were talking, just those two pivotal moments really combining to help position you to where you are today. As we talk about the stress part, tell me a little bit about how you managed your stress during the first situation, right? Because Mm -hmm. I know personally for me, my financial situation used to stress me out like beyond capacity, you know, worrying about whether I was going to be able to pay the bills or pay daycare if I needed to overdraft my account, like I was talking about with Gail, like that part of it sometimes got me in a rut where I was like, you know what? I can't even do anything, so I might as well do nothing. Mm. Tell me how you managed your stress during those circumstances, I guess maybe pre and post, because I'm sure there was some sort of a mind shift that you had to make. Right, right. Yeah, so I did for myself what I do for clients and anyone I work with. I go back to, I'm going to say the source or the core of it all. I take it back to motivation and value, right? When I had that first moment at the bankruptcy attorney's office and I had to sit with myself, that was me getting back to my heart. Like I left with the idea saying, I'm going to go into real estate. I'm about to ball out and be rich. And then I don't have to worry about nothing. Don't make me choke on this. <laughs> <laughs> but what was behind that statement was I wanted to be free. I wanted to create impact and I wanted the freedom to have creativity, right? And so when I had time to really roll the tape back from that initial statement, right, and really get back to my core, my motivation, my value, and be clear on that and sink my teeth in that and use that as the fuel to navigate the hills and the valleys, that makes the difference. So whenever I'm working with someone, because 99% of us will say what we want or what we think we want. I want to buy a house, I want to buy a car, I want to start a business, I wanted that what is doing that going to do for you, right? Mm. I ask questions to kind of peel back the layers to get to the root value there, the root motivation, right? So because often we are tied to, we're so uh, attached to the thing we say we want, right? And not really clear about what that is. And I encourage people to really roll the tape back to that core motivation and value and be committed to that, right? And not attached to how you have to get there. Okay. Does that make sense? 
It does. Absolutely. Because one of the things that I teach too is where we start at is identifying your value Mm -hmm. because it's so much tied to your why. And I believe that when you know what that is, it does help you in managing your stress a bit more Mm -hmm. because look, everything is not always going to be rainbows and sunshine and butterflies, you know, and unicorns and stuff dancing around. And when you're in those moments, it's being able to connect to that why, mm-hmm. connect to those values to mm-hmm. push you up over that hill sometimes and yes. push you right on back up. So that's great. No, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. You also talked about being in better financial shape after going through that. Talk mm-hmm. to me a little bit about that as well. Okay. So there's two sides to it. So when I left, I wanted to be, I wanted financial freedom. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the line, I gained an understanding that what I really wanted was to be free financially. Wait a minute. Don't you go past (laughs) that. Break that down. That sounds like the same thing. So initially I wanted to be financially free, meaning I didn't want to have any debt. Right. Okay. As the journey continued and life continued, Once I discovered that I wanted to be free financially, which means I wanted to be free in my heart and my mind around the area of finances. Mm. And I learned to do that whether I had some debt or not. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I was so attached to being financially free. I got to get rid of debt. I renamed myself to All Cash Queen. I started a blog. I'm out here. I'm taking the world by storm. (laughs) Not a bad thing. I'm still on that journey, but when it didn't add up, it didn't come as fast. I had to learn to be free financially, not so hung up in this one ideal picture of what it could look like, right? And so I'm better financially. Yes, I rebuilt my credit from the ground up. I think I have like an 806 credit score. Ooh, wee. Yes. Come on now. Um, you know, time for me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's some cash in the bank, you know, there's some savings, you know, there's a few things set up here. So I'm better financially and I know how to help people do these things. So I'm better, I'm smarter, I'm stronger. Also, I'm mainly better because now I have the mindset and the heart set and the understanding of what it is to be free financially. Because even as I went after that goal to be financially free. And I hope I'm not confusing people with that, but I was so attached to it. So attached. So I'm just wringing my hands like, ah, right. So again, when things weren't adding up, I wasn't happy. And it was just get after the goal, get after the goal, get after the goal. And I found that I wasn't living. I had a list of one day, if that then, <laughs> You know what I mean? And I was just like, like a bucket list type of yeah, get rid of the debt, get rid of the debt. And one day I'm gonna get to the little list and start living. And then it was like, yeah, no, Mm-mm. I want to be free. And when when I became more free in my heart and in my mind around the area of finances, I swear to God, more money came, <laughs> more debt went away. Like it's just better. So I'll give you a practical version of that. Now I follow you know, baseline, smart financial steps. Mm -hmm. I have some savings going. I keep my credit strong. I keep my debt low or non-existent other than my home and then in my car. And then I do a little investing, you know, my baseline 401k, mutuals, you know, I'm not a savvy, savvy investor. And then outside of that, I've got a list of what gives me joy, what makes me happy, what is going to make me feel more free financially. And for me, some of that is fixing up my home, you know, making my space. You know, Patrice, our mentor, talks about all the different areas, right? My health. I do a lot of self-care. Like that's a big bill for me. Yeah. <laughs> and guess what? I'm happy. Again, because look, <laughs> self-care manages that stress in and of itself. Yeah. You know, so there's a self-care bucket. There's a take care of your space, but I'm I'm working on my home, you know, different things, taking adventures, you know, vacations or whatever, trying new things. All of these things were important to me, but I was pushing everything aside, Mm -hmm. just focused on the debt. 
Mm. Once I freed myself financially to not be so overly concerned about the dead and uh, she read it. Everything started to flow, it sounds like. Everything started to flow. And I'm blown away because never have I ever looked at it from a financially free versus free financially. Because Mm -hmm. many of us who get into the entrepreneur space are looking for just that, right? Mm -hmm. Not financial freedom, to be free financially in your mind and in your heart. Mm -hmm. Because the stress for me that came with working in a role where I was unfulfilled, highly compensated, right? Where I'm not stressing about money, but I'm stressing now about going into a place that I've outgrown. I'm stressing about the work that I'm doing that does not feel fulfilling. And so being able to position yourself to be free financially, I think is something, not even I think, I know it's something that I'm already teaching to my children, to the mm-hmm. people around me, because I'm not knocking anybody being in corporate. Listen, I've got over oh. two decades of corporate <laughs> and it has made me who I am. Yes. But I also found that before I hit the six figure mark, there was a lot of financial stress still associated with working because I didn't have time to do the things that I wanted to do. You know, year over year, salary raises are 3% to 5%. And it was a lot. So for those of the listeners who are in a position where finances are stressing them out completely, Mm -hmm. How can we help them? Do you have any tips that you want to give on how to manage finances when you're stressed out about it? Right. So it still follows pretty much the same flow. It's still first getting clear about what's important to you, right? Getting back to the core. Because I feel like as we journey through life, we kind of get off into the thing. We're living life, we're paying bills, we're taking the kids, you know, da 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 da. And it's just such a world. (laughs) It's being busy. It's such a whirlwind, right? So Taking a moment, slowing it down, getting back to the motivation and value, number one. Secondly, where is the money going? You know, kind of starting, I mean, I know we don't want to talk about it, the B word, the nasty little B word, but we have to know where the money is going, right? So I don't like the budget word either. I like a spending plan because it's a plan of how I am going to spend this money. I'm going to spend Mm -hmm. it. So let me make a plan. (laughs) I'm going to spend it. In mindset wise, we stop there. We talk about how do you feel about the budget? How you, you know, and most people will give words like it's stressful, it's restrictive. So starting there is switching it around. I encourage people to change the name. Mm-hmm. People have called it their financial freedom plan, their leave this terrible job plan, <laughs> like whatever mm-hmm. is going <laughs> to help you feel better about the process towards this, right? Or approaching or using this as a tool because it's really just a tool, right? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, well, thirdly, when we're seeing where the money is, you know, a lot of times we know it's a deficit because we feel the stress of it, right? But we don't know what the deficit is, right? So feeling like there's not enough money and knowing that a thousand dollars extra per month would make your life better are two different animals, right? If you know exactly what the, you know, the initial shortage is, you can make more strategic steps around that. And then if you're connecting that to your value, if there's not enough and you know what the amount is, that could help inform your next steps, whether it is taking a moment to change what's there. You know, they, we always go to cut the lattes and, you know, do this and that. Yeah, you can do that. If that used to be like, cut the cable off. (laughs) If if that's your ministry, you can definitely do that. But I encourage people to choose your struggle, right? And it sounds like, why I want to choose a struggle? Because you're the one that's going to have to walk it out. So I've had people, when they connect with their values and they can, we can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. I had people give up their apartments and go and surf a couch for six months. I know that's not Mm -hmm. feasible for everyone. Does that though? Absolutely. Right. Because you now have a plan tied to your motivation, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, motivation and value, seeing where the money's going, seeing what's really, truly, specifically going on, coming up with a very strategic and intentional plan around that. And if you've been thinking about improving or getting a certification or changing careers, there is no more of a better motivation to knowing exactly 
what that is, right? If I could just finish this certification, I could get a certain increase in my current career, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Or if you could decide to give up certain, if you choose to give up cable, if you know that cable is $200 a month, right? And that $200 will help you pay something off that'll free up $500. I don't know. But when you get more specific, you can be more intentional and more strategic about what this plan is. But you have to come up with a plan. Nothing is going to change if we don't start somewhere to move towards changing stressed or not, right? Yeah, like all of those are so good. And I think myself included, when stressed, would jump straight to, like I said, cut the cable off, but not take the time to really understand where is the money going and Mm -hmm. what is the deficit? Because like with any kind of work, it's hard work. You got to look and you got to see. And I remember, you know, I used to feel horrible going through my statements because I'm like, wow, I spent spent $600 on food. Like that is no way. The bank account is lying. Somebody stole my card. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, that shock value. And then once you realize it, being able to say, okay, what kind of changes can I make? Mm -hmm. But not being so... Some are drastic and some are not. For me, I used to be a all or nothing, but now I'm learning for my sustainable success. It's taking the steps, right? Mm -hmm. Like I might not cut all the cable off, but what we need 15 HBOs for, right? (laughs) Like we don't. How about we cut some of those, reduce the bill, but really being able to step back, like you said, and Mm -hmm. tie our values in. I would like to do a little bit of myth busting before... I get into the end of the podcast because I know that there are questions that I had, questions that still come up that I see all over the internet street sometimes. (laughs) So I have three of them that I want to hopefully have you be able to debunk. (laughs) Bring it on. The first one is debit is always better than credit. Debit is always, that is who is telling that lie? <laughs> they are. You know who they are. <laughs> Them. Well, as a coach, my answer is almost always it depends, right? So it depends on, you know, what you're doing, what your goal is, what your strategy is. And so I encourage people to be clear about, you know, what their motivation is. Mm-hmm. And so I know one in terms of security, when you choose credit over debit, you have the same protection for that purchase is if you did it with a credit card versus mm-hmm. if you did it with the, so I often will choose credit over debit. Okay. Even with my debit card. Wow. Boom. Okay. <laughs> Debunked, dismissed. Yeah. Out of there. <laughs> so I would imagine people are saying debit because they want the money to be gone from their account. Mm-hmm. Right. And they don't want account to it. They don't want them to trick themselves and end up with a big credit card bill. However, you can still use your debit card, choose credit, have the protection of that purchase that you get with the credit card, but just by using, still using your debit card. So it still comes out. Mm. So I think I. No, you answered it. It's debunked and dismissed. Debunked that one. Done. (laughs) The other one. And I lied. I have four, not three. All right. So the other one is. You should always buy a home at all costs, no matter what you need to own a home. Uh, So it always depends. Again, it goes back to people's motivations and values, where they are in life. I have a colleague, he's in the financial space as well, and he is 100% all about being completely debt free, right? Mm -hmm. And so he rents at this time. He's not purchasing a home. And his thing is just all out. He is just motivated, determined, value driven to be 100% debt free. And that's what makes him tick. That's what keeps him going. That's what fuels his internal fire, right? Mm -hmm. And so he got so far in the journey and he made a decision. No, I'm not. I'm going to hang out here until I can do this. So again, personal finance is 80% behavior. That will be the person. So as you choose financially astute make choices, right? Or mathematical choices, understand that 80% of it is you. It has to resonate with you because you're the one that has to walk the journey. You know, when it came to me, originally I was, I got to be debt free, you know, this and that. I wanted to buy a house cash. 
after a while hanging out and I had lost everything. I had moved home for several years and I'm a grown woman. So, oh, bro. I got hey, there. so I came to a place where a huge part of who I am and my personal peace was owning my space. And so she bought a house. Boom. Yeah, did. Now, now, did she buy a good house with a good value? You know, and she has great equity. Yes. Right. So mathematically, I'm outpacing, you know, my mortgage. Mm -hmm. Um, But where I was, was I needed a house for my heart, for my peace, for my soul. Okay, Mm -hmm. she wanted to paint the walls, whatever she wanted to paint them. She wanted to put words on her wall. (laughs) That was what she needed. And you guys, all I see is believe she could. So she did. I'm assuming at the top it says she believed she could. So she did. That's what the right behind you yeah yes yes that's what's on the wall so it depends there's no cookie cutter there is not one human being that's like the other so there's baseline smarts that you can follow but you have to factor you into the equation I love that you are pointing that out because too often from what I see people are trying to find this cookie cutter approach, Mm -hmm. right? Like if I just do what Dave Ramsey said, if I do, you know, just what Patrice said, Mm -hmm. if I do it exactly like them, but it takes you out of it. And if 80% of our personal finance is based on us and our behaviors, it has to be an individualistic approach. So Mm -hmm. thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Um, The other one I have is investing is for rich people. Oh my. (laughs) No, I wish I could pop open a PowerPoint and show you the power of uh, compounding interest. You know, if anyone could just Google the power of compounding interest, it just kind of shows you how investing, I forget the exact example, but it gives, most of them give the example of a person investing a small amount early on in life and stopping maybe 10 years into it and leaving it there. And then a person starting a little bit later in life and kind of piling more money in there. And the one who went early and did a little and stopped, they outpaced them. But the point of it is, you know, they both are just doing smaller amounts. You know, there's even, I forget what they call it, dollar amount investing, where, and there's so many apps now. Penny stocks and all of that. Penny stocks or what it is, I can't remember the name, but it's the concept where you put in $15 a month. And as your balance is able to buy shares or portions of shares, you're still collecting investments. Mm -hmm. So do you wait until you can buy a thousand shares or a hundred shares of something at thousands of dollars? No, you just get in at whatever level you can get in. The earliest you get in, the better. Because again, if you just Google the power of compounding interest, it is the motivator to get in today where you fit in. So pause this now, go invest because it's not right. just for rich people. It's right. part of attaining wealth, right? right? At any stage. And it's like we said earlier, with anything that you're doing, it's taking those little small steps. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. about going big or go home because right. that's perfect. Today, yeah, it's going to provide you the opportunity to grow that compound interest. Mm-hmm. Now, what I will say with investing, I'll encourage people to look at their debt management in conjunction with investing because you don't want to be doing bad math. And mm-hmm. so what that means is you don't necessarily fully want to be carrying, let's say, a credit card with 29% interest and you're putting the bare minimum to that um, credit card and then you're piling money over into an investment. Mm-hmm. And so the credit card is costing you right? 29% because you're paying the minimum and the investment is maybe earning you about maybe 8%. So you want to, yeah, that's bad math. (laughs) So you want to, you know, compare the two and kind of see more of a strategic plan of how you can more aggressively pay the debt down because it's costing you more than your investment is making you. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I know somebody like, yes, I needed to hear that. I knew I should have paid off them credit cards. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. The last one that I have for you is that it's healthy to always carry at least a little bit of debt. So (laughs) it's in that depends. You should be in HR because HR is always, well, it depends. (laughs) You know, 
ironically in that one I don't know if it quite depends because really? I just don't I'm not familiar with a circumstance where it's healthy to carry a bit of debt if you don't have to mm-hmm. right so maybe that's the it depends okay so if you're in a situation like I explained kind of my story where yes I had debt and I wanted to be debt free but there was a point where I was like okay it's going to be important for me to live as well as pay off debt. And so- You want to be debt free and can't do nothing. <laughs> right. So in that instance, it was healthy for me to allow the debt to stay in its place a little bit longer than initially planned. Mm-hmm. Now, So that's that situation. Now, if it's a situation where you feel like you have to keep debt around in order to build up your credit or something like that, that's a lie. Okay. And that's exactly where that came from. Like, yeah, I don't want to pay my credit card off because then my score going to drop. Are they going to close the account? Those sort of things. Yeah. I hear so frequently. And I'm telling you, yeah, it's so frustrating to hear. Mm-hmm. And there's so much misinformation, miscommunication around yeah. that. So I wanted to make sure that yeah. what I know is right. <laughs> yes. So with that one, you know, you could do the same thing. You can use a credit card to pay bills that you have the money for. Just put them on the credit card and then pay that credit card balance on time without actually going into debt, right? Because you just use the credit card so that it could report to your credit report a good payment history, which makes up, which is like the biggest factor in your credit report, right? Mm -hmm. And then paying it on time is the second biggest factor. So you could be doing that all the time and strengthening your credit without actually going into debt. Yeah. Because I've had people buy cars. <laughs> like, I shouldn't need to put my credit report. And I'm, I am just like horrified. You said what now? <laughs> you bought a whole car? Like, like a whole car? We could have done this with a $300 credit card. Okay. So yeah, yeah. that's a total lie from the pits of hell. Oh, we. <laughs> you do Man. not have to do that. Yeah. Thank you for debunking and dismissing that as well. So listeners, I hope nobody else thinks that they have to have some debt in order to build their credit. Okay. No. Oh, this has been so amazing. I want to ask you a couple of questions that I ask each and every guest because I find the answers sometimes to be similar and it makes for a well-rounded episode just to kind of see how you would handle these things. So go. number one, mm-hmm. if you could go back in time to the 17 year old version of yourself and give her one piece of advice and one piece of advice only, what would it be and why? To live a little bit more. I spent so much of my life in the box, mm. in the lines, coloring in the lines and you know, over analysis. And therefore, paralysis. Analysis, paralysis. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I would encourage her to live a little, a lot more. Yeah, for those reasons. Okay, Mm -hmm. that makes sense. And I've heard a couple of other people say the same thing because sometimes at 17, not only are we, you know, naive in the sense that you know, we can do anything. So we don't let things stop us, but we're also so worried about what other people think. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't really know who you are. I'm broaching 40 and I am just learning who I am. (laughs) Right. So I love that. Yeah. The second one is since we're on the flow and flourish podcast, tell me something that you do on a regular basis to make sure that you're able to flow and flourish every day. Um, that, that whole self-care scene, that's my jam. <laughs> yeah. And I do it from so many different angles, right? It's Talk so, to me about that a little bit. Yeah. So, of course, prayer is my core center. You know, I'm always slow, trying to take time to slow down and, you know, get in touch with myself and some prayer and get centered. Mm-hmm. And then there's spa treatments, you know, in terms of self-care. Mm-hmm. But also, I because I'm a coach, I'm into like different, I understand what my personality, like I've taken the test, different assessments. <laughs> therefore, I know I, a lot of the work I do is around strengths. 
right? Mm-hmm. Coaching is from a strength and positive, positive psychology perspective and versed, Bill, versed in what gives me strengths and, and, and keeps my energy higher. Mm-hmm. And so I know that I love sunshine and outside. So I'll strategically make sure I put those things in. Like I was just sitting outside before we started our episode today. That's why you're glowing, girl. That's why I'm glowing. Yeah. <laughs> fun with friends. I know that laughter is this soup for the soul. And so mm-hmm. there's times where sometimes I'll put it in the schedule, but I would just go sit over my, one of my girlfriend's house who you just need to be in her presence to laugh. <laughs> like it's yeah. an automatic thing. Yeah. Or I will pull up a YouTube video of comedy or go watch a Netflix special. So I'll sprinkle little things in there that I already know help me stay more positive, keep my energy higher, and those things that help to build on my personal strengths. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I I mean. I take it from different perspectives. And it's good. I appreciate you showcasing it from both an inside and an outside perspective because, Mm -hmm. yes, the spa treatments are good. Yes, going to get our nails done and whatnot. But that prayer, that understanding what brings you joy, the laughter, the Mm -hmm. girlfriend time, all of those things significantly impact our capacity. Right. Okay. So last but not least. All right. (sighs) Deep breath. Mm. We've talked about a lot today and you've given us so much information. Mm -hmm. What is the one thing that you want the listeners to walk away with after hearing this episode? Mm, That is a deep breath, isn't it? Because it's a lot. Like one thing? (laughs) You know, what comes up for me is give consideration to yourself. I think that we are so outside of ourselves. It's a concept or whatever that says that, you know, it's kind of being in the now in ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are either looking back on what had happened was or we were <laughs> forward on I'm trying to get somewhere and we're not taking in our now or considering ourselves, considering what's important to us, considering what matters to us in relationships, in careers, in our pursuits, right? But give consideration to yourselves. We beat ourselves up. We talk to ourselves nastily. We'll be encouraging everybody else, but we just so don't give consideration to ourselves as human beings. Yeah. Ooh, that's really good. Nobody's ever said that. (laughs) So being able to consider ourselves, extending that grace that we give to everybody else. And I can imagine, and I know in my own experience, when you do that, the impact and capacity that it has on your finances is tremendous. Because you mentioned, you know, once you got right in here in your heart with what you wanted, what your values were, and you prioritized yourself and your needs versus what they said you should have, it started to flow effortlessly. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for being a guest. Before I let you get out of here, let everybody know where they can find you, if you have any programs or things going on right now, because listen, y'all, Rhonda is the real <laughs> deal and just such an amazing person to work with. So let us know where they can find you. Absolutely. So you can find me on the socials, like the young people say. In the internet streets. <laughs> on Instagram is Rhonda on a mission. That's R-H-O-N-D-A on a mission. I'm on LinkedIn as well, linkedin.com slash Rhonda on a mission and Facebook. On IG, you can click the link in the bio. You can find my podcast. You can find how to work with me. And I have a course out there, five secrets to a 700 credit score. And that's the exact same things that I use to rebuild herself (laughs) after (laughs) and bankruptcy, exact same things that I use for that. Yay. And I'll have all of this information in the show notes. Rhonda, thank you again for busting the myths, for giving us tips and for spending your time and energy with me. I really, really appreciate you. Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. So was that not bomb? 
Like, I don't care where you are on your financial journey, but really being able to take the time and slow down and tie in not only your values, but what motivates you. And really looking at and understanding, where's your money going? I was the queen of putting all my information on a spreadsheet, but really not tracking it and understanding where the deficit was. So I want you to take, if nothing else, from this episode, know that no matter where you are on your journey, you have the power to start today, to make some changes, to stop being stressed about your finances. And myself, Rhonda, and lots of other women are here to help you so that you don't have to do it on your own. All of Rhonda's contact information is absolutely in the show notes. So make sure you reach out to her. Let her know that this is helping you connect with her because she is the real deal, ladies. She really, really is. I know I can't wait to go back and re-listen to this episode because I know there are things that I missed during the recording and she dropped a whole lot of knowledge, ladies. If you loved this episode as much as we love recording it, make sure you go and share this with at least three other women who you know need to hear this. And then make sure that you come back next Tuesday because we're going to have another phenomenal guest. And we're going to continue to talk about how our finances and how we manage them, how it shows up in all these other parts of our lives. So until next week, continue to strive to flow and flourish so that you can show up in excellence regardless of the room that you are in. Whether it's the living room, the bathroom, the boardroom, any of those things, show up in excellence because you can. I will keep telling you also, don't be shy. Come find me in social media. Let me know that this is helping you. I am super responsive and super approachable, okay? Until next week, I look forward to continuing to be your capacity coach and helping you to increase your capacity for sustainable success by creating balance between your personal and your professional life. Talk to you next week. Thank you.